Well, y'all doing okay tonight? Praise God. I hope you are. I'm glad you came to the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. We're going to get into the word. Um, I just, right now, I'm just kind of like trusting that God's going to uh, gonna speak to me, and we'll see. I mean, just be led by the Lord. Amen. Where we go next. I was going to, I wanted to do Romans 11. That was the last chapter. Maybe I'll do it next week. I don't know. But anyway, the Lord put a, put a message on my heart, and uh, I titled tonight's message, Trusting God. And uh, the first part of my message is really just two main points. As a matter of fact, I believe that the musicians are going to probably have time to close us out in a song. I believe that. We'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> and um, trusting in God, point, there's just two points. Number one is following his lead. But then number two is, is he trustworthy? Can we trust God? You know, and I know you already know the answer to that. But these are some of the things that I want to talk to you about tonight. So in trusting God, the first, ver the first passage of Scripture I want to read to you is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Amen. Um, I don't want to forget that last little verse because I'd like to talk about that uh, before we're done with it. But just to, to mention a few things that were kind of standing out. You know, the scripture says, lean not on your own understanding. And so when I read certain things because of the way my brain works, the first thing that pops into my head is if I was talking to an unbeliever, you know, I can hear the secular humanist questioning, so God doesn't want me to use my brain? Is that what you're trying to say, preacher? God doesn't want me to use No. I can tell you, of course God wants you to use your brain. Amen. God wants you to use your brain. He just does not, because he, he, he gave it to you, he just doesn't want you to use it according to your own understanding. That's the problem. He doesn't want you and I operating in our own understanding. I've spent a lot of time whenever we teach the book of Proverbs, and I've talked about the concept of knowledge and wisdom and understanding. I've talked about the fact that knowledge, in a sense, as, it, as its basic place, describes information, informational knowledge. Like, in other words, I wish I would have remembered to bring the Bible, but I forgot to bring, I don't ever have a Bible up here, but I got a book. Let's just pretend this is a Bible and any kind of knowledge. This is proofs of a conspiracy. And if you want to know, it was written in the 1700s. And if you want to know what people knew about conspiracies back in the 1700s, you can open up this book and, this, and you can put this information on the inside of you. But that's just the first step. When we're talking about the Bible, the first step of coming to know God is to put the information about God to gain knowledge of God in the way that God communicates to man is through his word. Many times mankind doesn't want to be communicated by, to God or by God the way that God wants to communicate. So he gets frustrated and he says, oh, I tried that. And I know I've told you all that story, but I was thinking about it earlier today whenever we were on Bourbon Street. And I don't mean to wear you down with the same old stories, but I was on Bourbon Street with my brother-in-law, Aaron, and we were witnessing with a guy that would carry the cross out there. And I can remember the guy telling Aaron, I've already tried Jesus. And I can remember Aaron telling the guy, Jesus isn't a pair of shoes that you try on and if he doesn't fit you, that you put him back in the closet. In other words, Jesus is someone that when we're introduced to him and the Holy Spirit moves on our heart, when we get saved, we give our lives over to him. Amen. We become his servants. We become his children. And then we begin to live our lives for the Lord. That's what true Christianity is about. Now, if we live in the midst of a world where there's a lot of people that say that they love God and they believe in God, but not everybody truly wants to serve Him. Does that not make sense? You've met people like that before. God gave us a brain, and He wants us to be able to use our brain. He just wants our understanding to be filtered through His understanding, through His Word. Amen? He wants, and, and in order to have the understanding of God, like the proverb talks about, you got to put the knowledge in. And then once you have the knowledge of God, now you're able to apply it to your daily life. So with time, as you begin to learn God, you ought to not, when you hit a speed bump, ought to not be wrecking your car over the same old thing each and every time. 
Like sooner or later, if on your way to work, you know, oh, this is a dangerous intersection right here. You've seen multiple wrecks. Whenever you face that intersection again, you ought to not have to continue to get into the same old wreck, the same old mess each and every time. But if we have the knowledge of God and we refuse to apply the knowledge of God and allow it to become the wisdom of God in our life, then sometimes we find ourselves in the same old trap time and again. And sooner or later, as the knowledge of God becomes the wisdom of God, then the next thing you know, it becomes understanding of God to where it becomes part of our nature. And whenever we put the word of God in there and, it's, and we find ourselves in the midst of life circumstances, now God is saying, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Amen. God doesn't want us to lean on our own understanding. Amen. He doesn't want us to just uh, use our brain according to our own understanding, according to the educations of life that we have gained in our travels. I want to try to explain that a little bit. If you've ever, you know, I lived in, in Singapore and there was a lot of Australian people, and you learn about Australia people. It's so different over there, right? You've heard about Aborigines before. I remember one time I watched a movie. It was a, re- it was a pretty cool movie. I, can- I think it was called Australia. And, uh, and, and in it, they would talk about their walkabout. Have you ever heard of a walkabout? Does anybody know what that is? Anybody know what a walkabout is? Yeah, it's where they go off. It's kind of like, okay, this might be a little bit more relevant to you. Maybe you heard about this show, Going Amish. You ever heard of that show? It's, it's, it, it done died. I don't think it's still on TV anymore. But that's kind of like the idea of a walkabout. At a certain age in the Amish culture, they tell their young people, just go on out there and so 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 journey of life. Our journey of life is filled with all types of experiences. Naya's experiences are not my experiences, and Wade's experiences are not, and we might have some experiences that are similar, but the reality of it is is that we each as individuals have gained our own experiences as we've gone on our spiritual walkabout, as we've gone through the journey, and God doesn't want us to just take all of that information and still make our own make our decisions based upon just those things that have happened in our lives but yet he'll take those things and he'll mix it with his word and he will convince us in our heart that the things that happen in our life happen for a purpose amen and that through those things he can show us where we went the wrong way where we went off the path and he can bring healing to our hearts and our lives and so many times we are gaining our own understanding and we talk to people that even don't that aren't in the faith right and they and they don't understand what we believe they don't understand what makes our brain tick because they don't understand the knowledge and the wisdom and they don't have the understanding of God and so it doesn't make any sense so God doesn't want us just living life according to that and and again the experiences of life can help lead a person towards a better walk with God but look if we're not operating according to our own understanding right if we're still in the mode of our will versus God's will then there's a problem that's something that's really been alive in my heart over the last week or two where Jesus said that, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And in each and every one of our lives, there's so many situations and circumstances. You know, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I got three jobs right now, and I don't know if I like any of them. I'm, you can put it out there, broadcast it. But I'm grateful to have a job. I don't know that I like any of them, though, because there's always some little thing and some little nuance that I don't like. And, you know, I can pray to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, open up this particular door. And look, sometimes it looks like maybe the Lord will open the door. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Let me tell you something. If you've gone out on your own a few different times already, and I know that I have, and tried to prepare or to produce my own will, God says, is that really what you want? And, and y'all heard the story before. Israel wanted a king. Okay, is that what you really want? Here you go. You can have Saul. Then we realized real quick, no, we, re- we were just joking, Lord. We don't want Saul. Okay, but guess what? 
not according to our own understanding. God wants to work, and he can use those things in our life and our past experiences, and he can mix it with his word, and he can mix it with his grace. He can mix it with his mercy, and he can do a great work on the inside of our hearts and our lives and convince us that we don't want to go backwards into the places that we were before. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. You know, when our understanding is filtered and augmented by the will of God, what does augmented mean? I mean, in medicine, you know, there's a, there's a med- medicine called augmentin. It's just simply amoxicillin with an added ingredient that boosts its power. The Word of God wants to augment our, wa- our walk with God. It wants to give us power to be able to do what God is wanting to do. You know, and, and, God, and it's augmented by the will and the word of God. And then failures of the past tend to serve to move us towards God's successes for our future. In other words, what I want you to know, too, at some point I'm going to bring a scripture up that says that God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. Yeah, he's got a future and a hope for each and every one of our lives. And many times in our own way, yes, a lot of times other people for lack of better words, jack up God's plan for our lives. But many times we're part and parcel to that. We've invited it in. Now, we, a lot of times we don't want to take responsibility for that. But that's not how that works. You can't just not take responsibility for your own actions. We got to come. You don't have to come clean with me. We got to come clean with the Lord. And we got to let God know, look, Lord, I know that I went down this pathway, but that was a wrong pathway. Now take all of that wisdom that I've learned, amen, and turn it in into something good. So at that, he wants to give us success for our future. And look, when we come to this place of humility and allow ourselves to be humble towards the will of God for our lives, that's the thing. Because many times there are certain aspects. I mean, you could be happy at your job. You could be happy in your marriage. You could be happy with your children. But there may be something else that you're not happy with. But yet God has you in a place. Does that make sense that God knows how to orchestrate the hearts and the lives and the situations of his people that are called by his name, and that he will allow certain things to happen, amen, in our life to bring us to the place where he desires to bring us. What does it take for a person to really believe that God has what's best for them? For you as an individual, when you think about God and you think about your own life, what does it going to take for you, whoever you are, to, to really believe that God has what's best planned for you. Because like if, if I gave the microphone to each one of y'all, I guarantee you that some of you, really and truly probably every last one of you, would be able to voice something that you're not pleased about in your life. Something that's really kind of like a thorn in your flesh. Something that's really, really irritating you and making you wonder, God, why won't you remove this thorn? Why won't you set me free from this situation or this circumstance? But guess what? God orchestrates events in our life for a purpose because he's bringing us in a certain direction. And the question is, can we trust him? Can we believe that he has what's best planned for us? Amen? And then to trust God in his decisions for our lives so that that plan can come to pass. I just want to real quick give you two examples. I'm not going to even turn to them in the scriptures. just going to kind of talk to you about them because they're stories that you're probably familiar with. The first is Lot. What I'm talking about here, again, remember, is can a person really believe that God has what's best in store for them? Can we believe that his decisions for our lives are the, or is going to be the best decision? And can we trust him when he begins to reveal his plan for our lives? And when we look, and sometimes, like for in, in the instance of Lot, and y'all know the story. The, Lot and Abraham, you know, Lot was supposed to be a believer. Lot was a believer. I believe that. Lot made a decision to live for the Lord. He didn't do what his wife did and turn back and go towards Sodom. When it was time to get up, when the Lord said, get to moving, Lot moved. His wife turned around and wanted to hold on to the, to the world, and it brought destruction over her life. But look, in the early stages of Lot's life, the Bible says that Abraham and Lot's herds became so large that they had to split up. There was a bunch of dissension and division going on between the herdsmen. And Abraham said this. He said, listen, Lot, you take what you want 
and, I, and whatever's left, I'll take that. Now, there's a lot that could be said about that, and this is something that I believe the Lord showed me a long time ago, and I've preached it many times. Abraham was making his decisions based upon an eternal promise that had been given to him. Abraham made plenty of mistakes of his own, my friends, so don't ever think that Abraham was perfect. But God spoke a, a word to him, and it was a promise given to Abraham that was an eternal promise that had to do with the salvation of the entire human race. And based upon that, Abraham knew God in a way that many of us can never really understand God. But God wants us to understand him that way, right? And Abraham was making his decisions based upon the eternal promises of God. Lot, on the other hand, the Bible says he looked at the plain of, of, of Sodom, which was the area, if I'm not mistaken, by the Jordan, and it was well watered. See, as a herdsman, you need water and you need grass. He made a decision to pitch his tent towards Sodom. The Bible doesn't say that he pitched his tent in Sodom. The Bible says he pitched it towards Sodom. I don't even know how far away he was because I don't remember. Again, I'm shooting from the hip whether or not the word of God tells us. It doesn't tell us, you know, in military terms, he pitched his tent 40 clicks from Sodom, whatever a click is. I don't know. He pitched his tent 20 miles from Sodom. I don't know. But however far it was, it wasn't far enough. Many times we think, oh, we can distance ourselves from a situation, but yet here he is every morning when he wakes up, he, he looks outside of his tent and there's Sodom right there. And the next thing you know, he's knee deep in the midst of it. What I'm trying to say to you is that sometimes the plans that God has for your life, they don't seem to make sense. It makes sense to see a well-watered plain with green grass. I'm a herdsman. There's water. There's grass. It makes sense. This is the decision I'm going to make for myself. But yet at the same time, it ended up being a horrible decision, right? And you and I need to be aware of that. That many times we cannot lean. The Word of God says, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Amen? And so that was Lot. But what about Naaman? Naaman's a whole different story. Y'all remember Naaman the leper. I've preached on him several times. And one of the things that I remember about Naaman the leper is, is that he heard the story that there was a prophet, and that if he got over there, he was going to be healed of his leprosy. Y'all remember that? And what ended up happening is they said, oh, they tell prophet Elisha, hey, listen, this, this mighty man has come over here, and he's got leprosy, and he wants you to heal him. And so Elisha comes over the, out there, and he looks at the, pro, at, the, at the leper. And I don't really know exactly that it happened like this, but this is how it seems like it happened. Okay, go on. Well, he didn't wave his hand because Naaman said, I thought he would wave his hand. So he comes out there, maybe his hands were in his pocket. Oh, yeah, we got the cure for you. Go dip in the Jordan seven times. And what does he say? He says, are not the rivers of Damascus much superior to this water of the Jordan? And he was perturbed in his spirit. He was frustrated because, see, his will was something different than God's will. He said, I thought surely this man of God would come out here and wave his hand in the air and heal me of my leprosy. But instead, he comes out here and he tells me to dip in the Jordan. It doesn't make any sense. I want to dip in the Jordan. And he starts getting aggravated. See, sometimes, dude, our flesh will get in the way. He starts getting aggravated. He's like, you can, pack up the, you can pack up all the belongings and set it on the, on the horses or the donkeys, whatever we have, because we're going back to Syria because this is ridiculousness. And so then his servants come and talk to him. And they're like, Matt, 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 and they're like, Matt. Come on, what's it going to hurt? Just go dip in the Jordan. You know what the Bible says is that he dipped in the Jordan, and on the seventh dip when he come up, the Bible says his skin was refreshed and new, hallelujah, like a child's skin. I'd like to have a child's skin right now, amen? Lord, re renewal, salvation, new life, a restart, hallelujah. And look, but he, he missed it. Boy, look, he almost missed it by that much. Because he didn't like the way the Lord was wanting to do it. Not my will, but your will be done. Can God be trusted in your life when he speaks to you one step at a time? He's not asking, listen, sometimes I've been getting ahead of myself. Look, 
<laughs> I shared with y'all a little, no, I didn't give you all the details because, you know, you, you don't always give me all your details. We can hold on to some of our details. But I was going through some things. And, you know, sometimes when we're going through something, we just want the Lord to get us out of it, right? Because I don't know about you, but I don't like pain. I mean, if my hand touches fire, I'm going to pull it back. Okay, but one of the things that I've learned is, is that when I'm going through something, the Lord will begin to speak. He'll begin to speak. And one of the things that I learned in the midst of this recent little thing I was going through is this, is that I got a problem. I, Matt Abair, have a problem. Okay, now don't be looking at me down like, like, like that because I can see it. Well, we could have told you that, preacher. Okay, but I needed the Lord to tell. And some of you have. And, it's, and when you told me, some of you, and you might even know who you are, it's not that I didn't believe you. <laughs> I believe it a little bit more now. Part of my problem is that I want to be a fixer. I want to fix everything. I want to fix everything. I want to fix everybody. My motives aren't bad. I don't want you to think I'm God. <laughs> Please. I know I'm not God. I don't want to be your God. I don't want to have to personally fix each and every one of your sins. Matter of fact, part of my MO, if you will, my modus operandi, the meaning of what I believe God has shown me and part of our, this ministry is to teach people how to get a hold of Jesus for themselves. To teach people how to have a personal relationship with the Lord so that they can hear communication from God for themselves. Because, look, you can shoot me a text and you can say, what you think about this, Pastor? But in reality, you may not want to know what i got to think about this. Because I may lead you down a direction that's the wrong direction. And I would never do it on purpose, but there's a lot of pastors that are like that. They're like, oh, yeah, let me give you the word that the Lord has for you. But the problem is, is that sometimes they miss that. What we're supposed to do is lead people to Jesus. Let him be the shepherd of your soul. Amen? Praise God. But there's this part to Matt, and I'm not even saying that I'm really all that bad at fixing stuff in the midst of bad situations. But you know what the Lord spoke to me personally was this. Son, you're always trying to be two steps ahead of everything. You're always trying to fix everything. You're always trying to figure it all out. Your brain is working 110 miles an hour. And you're imagining every little scenario that can happen. And you're figuring out every little way to fix every little thing. But that's not your job. News alert, Matt Bear. that is not your job to, go, to be three steps ahead of every situation. Your job is to trust me. And when I give you a piece of information, you're to trust me in that. And you're to take a step in that direction. And if you'll do that, son, then I will lead you and guide you to the next step. And then the next step. And then the next step. But you go on, son, and you allow the weight of the world to try to lay on your shoulders. I can handle it. Even though I sweat blood, you can't handle it, little man. And you need to learn that you cannot fix it all. Now, don't think that, the God, that God doesn't want us doing anything, and we'll get into that in a moment. All right? But look. Lean, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. But I got this one figured out, Lord. I got this one. I'm going to take the wheel for a second here. No, 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 no. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. You know, this is one little area right there that I feel like sometimes I get right. In all your ways acknowledge him. I love it when I'm in a room and I tell somebody about my past. And I tell somebody about how I still do it. I did it last week at Bayou Pediatrics. I was telling somebody, I've been seeing them forever. I didn't even know you were a pastor. I said, yeah, that still happens sometimes, not as much as it used to. But, but dude, I said, girl, if I told you where I was before, why, really? You, you, you was a high. And, you know, and she didn't do it, but some people will be, but look at you now. Look what you did. Look how you picked yourself up. And, I'll, and I, time out. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That might work for some of y'all. Some of y'all might be feeling like, man, look what I did. But guess what? Not this dude, because I know good and well I ain't done nothing. Not as far, yeah, have I worked hard? Yeah, but he gave me the work ethic. One day, I mean, look, before God put the, any kind of work ethic in me, I was a bum, dude. I was, even as a nurse, I was the first one. Hey, who wants to go home early? 
I kept raising my hand. I want to go home early. Ain't nobody wants to work. And then I complained about my paycheck being low. And one time, my head nurse, she's the CNO over there at Terrebonne now. She said, Mac, quit raising your hand. You're a man. You're married. You got a kid. Get, get over there and go to work. Boy, that was probably the best word of encouragement I ever got from a, from a boss in all my life. Quit raising your hand. You ain't going home no more. You're a man. Stay here and work. Ain't that good? That's good. Thank you, Teresita. Amen. Praise God. Well, look, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Amen. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Amen. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. I like this part. I didn't plan on preaching this little passage. I got other scriptures I got to share with you. But I just want to close out of this passage of scripture to say this. It will be health to your navel. <laughs> Yeah, I looked it up to make sure, and, and it was what I was saying, it's umbilical cord. It will be health to your umbilical. It will be marrow to your bones. One of the, what he's trying to say is this, is that if you will trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding, if you will acknowledge him in all of your ways, he promises to direct your path. Amen? And if you will fear the Lord and depart from evil, it's going to be health to your navel. You know what an umbilical cord does? It brings nutrition and oxygenated blood to a fetus, to a human being that cannot function on its own without help from its mother. You know what marrow does in a bone? It is the place where red blood cells are produced, where oxygen can attach itself to red blood cells and be dumped off at the cellular level. It's talking about life. It's talking about hope. It's talking about the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, giving you hope, giving you life. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Depart from evil. Hallelujah. It's going to be health to your navel. God's about to, listen, in Christ, hallelujah, there's a, in this place, there's a connection. I mean, we've been umbilicated to Jesus. We've been connected to him. We got, we got a straight, a main line to the Holy Ghost because of what Jesus did. Health to your bones, hallelujah. Give us life, Lord. Give us life, amen. Now let's look at the scripture here. Psalm chapter 37 verse 23, Psalm 37, verse 23, says the steps of a good man. Now, I've tried to teach y'all some of this whenever you're going to be a studier of the word. If you look back at some of the other translations, ESV, NASV, whatever, whatever, they don't have that word good there. You see how the word good, you may not be able to see it in the back, but it's kind of italicized. You notice that? That means that, that the translators put it in there. Okay, but what I want you to know is this, is that if you click on the word man right there, the word literally means a warrior, a valiant man, a mighty man, a strong man. Now, I had some disagreements with my old pastor who I liked very much, Pastor Brad Bullock, about things having to do with the Proverbs. And one of the, I don't want to get into the details of it, but one of the things that I told him, I said, I don't think you're hitting that exactly right because this is the thing I need to say. This book that we read that we call the Bible, these Proverbs that were written by King Solomon under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit were written to the children of Israel who are God's people. That means that the communication that comes in this book and in these Proverbs are directly connected to God's people. That means whenever it says the steps of a Man, it's not talking about just any man. It's talking about a man that is willing to trust God. It's talking about a man or a woman that is willing to believe that God is real. It's, this proverb is not talking about the guy across the street or wherever he is that is unwilling to believe that God is real and worthy to be followed. But the steps of a Righteous man, the steps of a godly man are ordered by the Lord. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that no matter where you've been, God has ordered the steps of your life to bring you to the place where you are? He delights in his way. Look at this. Though he falls, God says, you shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Amen. I want you to know tonight that we go through things in life. That the steps of a righteous man, the steps 
of a godly man. The steps of a woman that wants to serve the Lord are led by God. They're ordered by God. Sometimes we step backwards and we question, how did I end up in this place? Well, what are you saying, pastor? Are you saying that God wanted me to open that wrong door and wreak all this havoc in my life? No, God didn't want you and I to do that. But that's part of the free will that he's given us as a gift. And he still doesn't waste it. He uses all those bad decisions. And along the way, he will still order our steps. And he plans to get us to the right place where he can speak to us. Amen? As a person walks with God and willingly follows the path that God directs him towards, God takes pleasure towards that individual. God's graciousness is poured out upon this individual because God sees him and walks with him. God wants us to know that he wants to protect us. It's not God's will that anyone is destroyed. Do you believe that? That's what the Word of God says. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that the Lord is not slack. It, that King James word means lazy. God's not lazy. Amen. It's not like he's resting on the couch. Like, so whenever, I'm just saying, for your personal situation, whatever you're going through, and you've been praying, you're like, Lord, I feel like I'm doing my part over here. I'm praying. The Lord wants you to know, Peter wants you to know, the Holy Spirit through Peter wants you to know that the Lord's not lazy. It's not like he's laying on the couch with the clicker and flipping through the channel. He's not slack concerning his promises, but instead what it is is that he's long-suffering. He's long-suffering. What does that mean? It means he has patience in relationships. It means he has patience, 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 patience. willing that any should perish, but that instead they should all come to repentance. Dude, that's, that's a good God. That is a good God. Amen? He, I might sometimes feel like I'm about to give up. Not on, not on God by, by his grace. Please, no, Lord. But on somebody else. Sometimes I might be like, I'm done. I'm done. But whoever. I'm done with this job. I'm done with this thing. I'm done with this. I'm done with that. Oh, that's the last straw. I'm done. But God is long-suffering because he's not willing that any should perish because he is love. Amen. And so that's the first part of what I wanted to talk to you about was can, is, is I'm sorry, is, what, what was my first point? I know, lost my train of thought. Following his lead. Will we follow his lead? You know, there's another scripture that I was going to put in here that I forgot. It was Psalm 46, 10. <laughs> Since we're talking about follow his lead, I just want to still say this because this is another something that the Lord has been whispering to me over the last few days. When he was telling me, Matt, it's not your job to fix everything. He also said this. He said, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, God's got a whole lot going on on this earth. We've been studying that in our little book thing. We will have the book study this Sunday, too, if you can make it. You know, God, he says, you be still and know that I am God, Israel, because I will be exalted on this earth. It's going to happen. God proclaimed it, and it's going to happen. The other nations will come to bow to me. But in your individual life, God also wants you to, he's got a word for you. Be still and know that I am God. Wait on me. Trust in me. Believe in me. All right? And so, so then the next question is, you know, I'm just going to do it like this because this is how I've been explaining it. So what does that mean, Lord? If I'm being still and knowing that you're God, do I just sit on my hands? Just sit here and not do anything? I know you're God. I'm going to be still. See, there's a balance to everything. God's saying, Matt, your balance is way off on the other end, dude. You're trying to fix everything, and sometimes you're trying to play God, and you ain't God. So guess what? You need to quit doing all that mess, and you need to be still and know that I am God. But there used to be a song that we used to sing in the old church. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move, you got to move, you got to move. Because look, when God says it's time to move, it's time to get up, and it's time to move. He said, I'm going to give you a pillar of cloud by day, and I'm going to give you a pillar of fire 
fire by night. And where the cloud rests, you stop, be still, set up your camp, and know that I am God. And when the light, but look, when the cloud gets to moving, when the fire gets to moving, you got to move, you got to move. So guess what? We could sit there on our hands the whole time. I'm just, what you doing? Oh, I'm just being still. I'm being still. And I'm knowing that he is God. Now, let me just say this. There's a, there, that, that takes patience. I pray, look, praise God for people that can really be still and know that he is God. Because I'll be thinking, oh, there he goes. There's a cloud moving. The Lord's like, that ain't moved no cloud, boy. Be still and know that I'm God. Right now, you need to be sitting on your hands because I have not moved that cloud yet. You're trying to convince yourself I moved the cloud. The cloud is still in the same spot that it was. I never told you to get up and move. Oh, but Lord, I'm a mover. No, be still. And know that I am God. I believe that when he wants us to get up and move, he's going to show us. Amen and amen. And guess what? That's the beauty of wanting to be a pastor that teaches people or wants to teach people how to know the Lord. So you can't send me a text and say, hey, what you think I ought to do in this? Well, I can tell you what I think you ought to do based upon the word of God. But I don't know. The Lord might want you being still and knowing that he's God. Or the Lord might be ready to move the cloud and get you up and get you moving. You got to hear from the Lord. Amen? You got to hear from the Lord. Because sometimes I was even sharing with a young lady that was walking into the church. Even when it comes to something like marriage. I'm just saying. Like, it might even be the right one. It might be whatever. But what if it ain't the right timing? Sit on your hands. Be still. Know that I'm all, oh, but I got an itch. I got an itch, Lord, and I got, I got a void, and I got a feel. Okay. If the, but if the cloud ain't moving, my friend, you know, and that's in every situation in life. That's not just marriage. That's everything. Man, this boss is just riding me hard. I'm like, I'm like a mule over here. Just, I'm just a pack horse, man. I'm just like... Like they just over, okay, and sometimes we feel like that. But guess what? Until the Lord says move, <laughs> because he's teaching us something. He's teaching us endurance. He's teaching us how to work in bad situations and by his grace have a good attitude. I mean, if you're going to be a servant, you're supposed to have a good attitude, right? He's teaching us things, and then guess what? Promotion comes from the Lord. When the Lord's ready, he said this. He said, I resist the proud, but give grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that in due time I may exalt you. God knows when to give promotion. God knows when to tell people to sit still. The question is, can we trust him? Amen. Can we, will, are we willing to be led by him? And that's point number two. Can God be trusted? This question, this is point number two, can God be trusted, is can we trust him? And so when I ask this question tonight, I'm not asking you whether you can come in here and listen to me tell you that you can trust God and just believe what I say to you. Because, and look, some of you people, I believe that y'all do think that I'm trying my best by the grace of God to speak truth. I don't think that you'd be coming here if you didn't believe that. But that's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking you whether or not you can believe that I'm telling you he's trustworthy. The question is directed towards each of you as individuals. Each of you in your individual life and walk with God. Have you come to the place, have I come to the place, where we can determine in our life that God is trustworthy? Amen? And you can trust him. And that he has a plan for your life, for my life. And that if we will allow him to, he will direct our path. He will bring us to the place that he has planned for us. Do we believe that? Or do we have our own plan for our own life and we're going to move and get ahead of God? The place he has planned for us may not be what we originally wanted or expected. Well, I don't like this deal. Is this the end of the rainbow? Uh, you know, I mean, is this what was behind curtain number three? I'm not happy with this. Well, that, guess what? That's flesh. Because if it's God's will, then you, need, you and I need to surrender to the will of the Lord, and he will give us peace. 
and he will comfort our soul. And we will be pleased with what he's brought us to. Amen? Praise God. I believe that. It's not what I expect. It most certainly won't be the place that your flesh was leading you to. That's an important thing to remember. But can God be trusted to the point that we will be willing to believe that the place that he leads us will be better than the place that we planned for ourselves? Can you believe that tonight? Can you believe that God is worthy to be trusted to the point that where he brings us in the end, wherever that is, whatever that looks like, will be better than the place that we were planning for ourselves? I believe that. Okay, what happens when it seems like the plan is going awry? I got the word right, Miss Bridget. What happens when the plan looks like it's going awry? Will we still believe that he is trustworthy? When the Lord, you know, that, that little saying people say, when the Lord is what you have, the Lord, when the Lord is all you have, the Lord is all you need. Amen. What happens in our life? Can we still trust him when he's leading and guiding us in a situation where it just doesn't look like it's working out? Like everything is about to internally combust and explode and it's all falling apart. And it's like, Lord, what, what is going on? And I feel like maybe that's what happened with Peter when he walked on the water. He saw the Lord. He was excited to see the Lord. I mean, look, he was in the midst of a storm. And he said, Lord, if that be you, bid me to come out to you. And so he begins to walk. And, you know, I, I was talking to Aaron the other day, and I thought he said something really good. He said, many times in our lives, the situation becomes so magnified that it appears bigger than the God we serve. I have a feeling that something like that happened to old Peter boy. When he walked out on that, he was like, that's the Lord. The Lord's walking on the water. I can go out there to meet the Lord. And then maybe, I can't prove it to you, but maybe when he stepped out of that boat, I was like, man, I didn't know it was going to be this bad out here. I felt safer inside the boat. And now, look, look, these waves are crashing. And, the, and then he starts to look around, and the storm is so big, and it's so violent, and the wind is howling uh, and just thrashing back and forth. And he's like, oh, my gosh, what a mess. What am I going to do? You don't even see the Lord still right there with him. The Lord's still right there because now the storm has gotten bigger than the storm stopper. The situation has grown bigger in his heart and in his eyes than the situation changer. And he takes his eyes off of the, of the Lord that can heal him and make him whole and get him safe to the other side. And he begins to put it on this mountainous situation that he knows he can't fix. And he begins to sink. Uh, the good news is, is this, is that that's going to happen in each and every one of our lives at some point in time. But hallelujah. If you know the answer, think about the poor people out there that don't know the answer. Now listen, this world is filled with people that are hurting, that are full of heartache and pain. And look, I work with, I work with people that are not very compassionate sometimes. I, I've learned to say it in a way where I don't offend them. I'll just like strike up a conversation about compassion. And I'll use myself as an example. But I'm really saying, talking to them. I'm like, you know, I went through this period as a nurse that I became very, very hard towards people. And people are walking in to, through this ER setting. And, dude, this is a mess of an ER where I'm working. Okay, I'm just telling you. I don't know if you ever plan to go visit New Iberia, Lord, forgive me. Mayor of New Iberia, forgive me, but you can just keep on driving. <laughs> they do have a couple of good restaurants, I heard. But anyway, it's a mess of a place. And the hurting and the broken are coming through there. You know, I had, there was a situation the other night, and I don't know what it was. It was a really weird situation. I, I mean, I'm not going to say her name, so it's not going to be a hip of, I don't even remember her name. It was the weirdest thing. Like this woman comes in and she's full of blood and she's full of urine. She's got a gash on her face. And I asked the policeman, like, what happened? Well, there was a stabbing and there's another person. And I'm like, well, where's the other person? He's dead in the other side of the ER. And then it's like, and she heard him say dead. And the demons, the demons are coming. And she started like freaking out. And come to find out, it was just one jook in this dude's leg that severed his femoral artery. And he's just like. Just like such a chaotic mess. Like, 
wow. Like you talk about change the whole culture of everything. And I just remembered, like I ended up sewing up. For, there's a lot to this story. It went on for hours. But I ended up sewing up the gash. And then at some point in time, she saw me. The, the policeman was watching her. And she said, hey, what's your name? And so I told her. Well, what's, your, what's your last name? And so I told her. Because at one point she was growling at me. I said, ma'am, I'm not, I'm not scared of that. And, and so, so whenever I, 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 she said, come see. She said, can, can, I, can I get some water? I'm like, absolutely. So I'll go get her some water. I said, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. She said, what are they going to do to her? I said, I don't know, sweet. She, she grabbed my hand. She, she grabbed my hand and she was holding my hand. She was like, Matt, what's, what's going to happen to you? And I said, I don't know, sweet. And she didn't want to let it go. And, you know, I, in the end, you know, we had to wheel her out and they were going to do whatever they were going to do with her. But she said, she said Matt, is it going to be okay? I, I said, I don't know, baby, but guess what? You, you know, you're going to, you know, I couldn't, it, it was crazy. I couldn't really just sit there. I guess I could have prayed for her right then. I should have. Lord, forgive me. I should have prayed for that woman. Nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is God gave me the grace to be compassionate. Compassionate to her in this particular situation. And I just notice how other people in that milieu, that's a fancy word for environments, are looking and they're scowling and they're like, Ooh, she's holding his hand and, you know, whatever. And, and I just, and I see the way whenever they come through and, and some of these nurses are like, what's your name? What are you here for tonight? What's going on? You know, and they're just tight. And that's exactly how they're asking the questions. And I'm thinking to myself, goodness gracious, dude, like, you're being so rude and uncompassionate that you're trying to prevent people from ever coming back here again because you're tired of working. But if your plan really works, you're not going to have a job. It's like nuts. It doesn't even make any sense. And people are hard. Amen. And they're going through things and the situation's getting bigger. And I don't even know where I was going, but the question is, can we trust him? Can we believe that he's going to get us through the situation? And can we, as his servants, act like he desires for us to act? I mean, now, whenever I look at it, when the girl at Burger King's rude, that's pretty like a small thing. You know, surely I can get through this little trial. <laughs> Or, you know, when the boss is mean, surely I can get through this little trial. Like, look at the way life is, man. Help us, Lord. And when he stepped out, the problem became bigger. It became magnified. You know, this mindset, whenever the situation gets bigger than, the, your, than your Lord, when it gets bigger than my Lord, this mindset results in the magnification of the situation rather than us magnifying the power of the Lord. Like, I don't care how bad the storm is. Don't tell me God can't stop it. Will he stop it? I don't know, but he's sovereign. And, and whatever, he, can he, but the question is, can he get me through? Even if I'm in the midst of the rubble, will he be able to work through all of that to do a work in my heart? Absolutely. The situation is never bigger than our God. So can we trust him? Two concepts regarding trusting God. First of all, what I want you to know is that he has a plan for our future. But look, it's hard to look to the future when we're living in today. <laughs> is that not true? Some of you have had so many conversations about the Lord, and we've talked about how short this life is, and we've talked about the future that God has planned for his people, but yet at the same time, and every last one of us in this place believe that. I think we do believe that, I think. Do we not? Do we not believe that? Even when we take our last breath here and take our first breath there, that we'll be in a better place. The Bible says there's not going to be any more sorrow. There won't be any more tears. There won't be any more pain. That's going to be a beautiful thing, right? And I believe that. I do. But what about today? Listen, we live in today. But I got to encourage you and let you know he wants to be with you today, every step of the way. He wants his grace and his presence to be with you, to give you the strength and the power that you need to understand the storm isn't bigger than your God. The situation isn't bigger than the God that you serve. There's still going to be bad times tomorrow. But why? Why can't he make it go away? The world has fallen. Human beings are fallen. Sin is rampant in the earth. But guess what? God can put us in a place where his grace gives us strength. Amen? So he wants to be with us every step of the way if we'll let him. 
Amen. We got to trust the Lord for the future destination, but we also got to trust him step by step. Now, I had two scriptures that I wanted to share with you. A little bit that I wanted to share. First off, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 1 because we're talking about the future. We're talking about the future hope that God has for people. Amen. This is, this is what the Lord told Jeremiah the prophet. Now, I got to tell you, I got to remind you, Jeremiah prophesied during a time in Israel's history when Israel was very, they, they were very rebellious. And their rebellion had led, would ultimately lead them under captivity. So as a nation, the sinful choices they made for themselves put them in a, kind of like you could say, a prison. And us as individuals, we got to understand this. The spiritual choices we make in our life can and will, if they're the wrong choices, put us in a spiritual prison. And so God sends Jeremiah to speak to a people that have been rebellious. And this is what he says to Jeremiah about about his plans for Jeremiah. He said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. God wants you to know, he wants me to know tonight, that before he formed you in the belly, he knew you. He knew Wade, he knew all, he knew the first breath Wade would take. I'm not picking on Wade, I'm just using him, I saw him. He knew the first breath Wade was going to take. He knew the last breath Wade was going to take, if he ever takes the last breath. Lord may come back for the rapture. Amen? He knew the first breath. He knows the last breath. And he knows every step along the way. Do you believe that tonight? I believe that, but sometimes I forget it. (laughs) I forget it. I don't want to forget it. Lord, help me remember. You knew the first breath. You see the last breath. And you see every step in between. And all you're asking me to do is to believe you and to trust you every step of the way. He said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nation. I had a plan for your life. Rich, I'm going to move you from New Jersey to Louisiana. Lord, how did I end up over here? I got a plan for you, Rich, and I knew it was going to happen at a specific time. I got a plan for you, Micah. You might be going through some things, but it's all part of my big plan that in the end, I know what you were going to go through, and I knew what I was going to do because of it, and I knew where I was going to bring you on the other side of it. And that's the same for all of y'all. It's the same for me. And he's just saying, now you just got to trust me. One step at a time, huh? How does that song go? I think it says one day at a time, right? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes I got to break that down even better, man. Like one step at a time, one minute at a time, one thought at a time, one thought at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me get through this crazy thought. Help me get to a better thought. Lord, help me get to a better step. And if I'll just trust you with the next step, you said you would show up and you would lead me to the next one. I, that's what he told me personally. And I believe it wasn't just for one situation. I believe he wants me to know that for the rest of my life. When I speak to you about something, whether it's through my word, in your prayer time, or whenever you're just watching Netflix and I finally wake you up from your slumber, whatever I speak to you, trust me, take the step, and I'm going to lead you to the next one. Amen? Even when things seem impossible and hopeless to us as his people, God has a plan for our future peace, and he wants to give us hope. Look, in Jeremiah chapter 29... Singers, musicians, y'all can go ahead and come because I want to close out with a song. Amen? (laughs) In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, really if we go back to 10, let's go back to 10 because I want to read that to you. Look, I want you to see the context. It says, for thus says the Lord, that after 70 years are accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and I will perform my good towards you. And causing you to return to this place. He was talking about Jerusalem. So what does that mean? 
That means that Israel, because of their rebellion, finds themselves under Babylonian captivity. That means when God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah, they are in bondage. That means that their life is in the midst of chaos. That means that things aren't going their way. Yet in the midst of that, God follows it with this verse. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Look, you're just going to have to trust me on this. I checked every other translation, and as crazy as it might sound to you, in my opinion, the one that catches it the best is the NIV. And now let me tell you why. Well, let me show you why, because I'm going to lose the Republican. If I read to you, if I read to you the ESV, I'm going to lose all the Republicans. Well, what you mean? The Lord plans for welfare. See, I lost y'all. Because society has changed the meaning of the word welfare. It didn't always mean government assistance. At one time, it meant good's going to happen to you. Yes. So I don't want to lose the Republicans. So you're just going to have to deal with the NIV for a second. Okay? This is what the NIV says right here. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, yes. not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God wants you to know that he wants to prosper you. Not just financially. Don't walk out of here thinking, oh, man, my pocket's about to be full. They might be. But no, he wants to prosper your spirit. He wants to prosper your mind. He wants to prosper your past. He wants to prosper you spiritually. Amen? Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead. And look, I had a couple other scriptures, but we need to close. But one of them was about this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said, Lord... Where am I going to get clothes? Lord, how am I going to pay my light bill? Lord, how am I going to feed my children? Lord, how am I going to get what I need? He said, look at this grass. It's more beautiful. The lilies of the field are more beautiful than Solomon's silken clothes. He says, aren't two sparrows sold for a farthing? A farthing was a little copper coin. It was the cheapest type of food you could buy at the market, a sparrow. And he said, and the Lord notices it when it hits the ground. He said, how much more you? He knows how many hairs you have on your head. The Lord cares about a sparrow when it falls to the ground. How much more does he care for you? Seek you for it. He said, don't worry about those things. Those are the things that the heathen are worried about. The people in the world are worried about all these other things. You don't have to be worried about that. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to get you through. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things shall be added unto you. Let's go out of the house of the Lord tonight, giving him praise. Amen. Hallelujah.